So I got something today on my heart that I want to share with you, and I'll try to have this done in the next hour or so, so that the next service can come in. Um, <laughs> actually, I only have, I don't even know, 25 minutes maybe to preach this, so that's not going to happen. Um, so here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to start with this. I'm going to continue the Hard Knocks thing. We're going we're to talk about mamas today. I'm going to highlight a specific mama in the Bible. Do you know that God uses women? You know, look at your neighbor right now and say, God uses women. Yes, he does. I don't care what anybody says. God uses women, right? If it wasn't for a woman that God used, you wouldn't be here. Come on. Yeah, I got three people got really excited right there, you know. But God, honestly, he's, he's used women all throughout the scriptures, all throughout the Bible, from the beginning all the way to where we are now in extraordinary ways and to do extraordinary things, right? I mean, that's just who he is. It's what he's done. So today, I could go through a list of a lot, I'm preaching a different sermon, by the way, than I did the first service, because I could go through a list of a bunch of women that God did great things for, but man, I felt the anointing when I started talking about one specific lady, and her name was Hannah, so look at your neighbor real quick and say, we're about to talk about Hannah. Have y'all ever heard of Hannah before? I personally think she's probably one of the most fascinating mentioned mamas in the Bible. Here was a lady who actually couldn't have children. We'll talk about that in a moment. And I understand you're probably going, well, you said she was a mama. I get it. But there was a process to the whole thing. And I think we can learn something from the life of Hannah. Because in accordance to what I know personally, okay, there is no greater heartache than for a woman to have the heart of a mother, but not be able to have a child. Okay. And some of you, you may be infertile here today. You may be trying to have children, but you can't have children. Uh, I don't really know how that feels to that extent, but I do know how it feels to go right at 14 years without being able to have a child. We, we wanted a child. We felt, we didn't feel. We knew that God had spoke to us and said that we were going to have a son. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but when God speaks to you and says that you're going to have a son... But then five years later, you still don't have a son. You're trying, you know. I was fixing to say some things. I'm, I'm not going to. It's okay. I'm human too, people. It hit my head. I about said it, but I didn't. It was the Holy Ghost that stopped me. Hallelujah. Right? But when you go five years and then you go 10 years, you go 12 years, and then you try to figure this thing out, even when Jill came, she came one day. Can I tell the story, Jill? Thanks. I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you know this story or not, but I'm going to give the short version of the story. She comes. She pulls me out of a very important meeting that I was in. I said, babe, you know, I'm, I'm in this meeting. What's going on? I've, I really got to talk to you. She hands me two pregnancy tests. Both of them are positive. I'm, here's, my, here's the man of faith I was at this point. Knowing that God had given us a word that we were going to have a child, Right? But the man of faith that I was is like, where did you get this? I mean, is this, like back then it was Craigslist. Like, yeah, did you get this off Craigslist? Whoa. What is going on? It, it, did you get this from, you order this from eBay? Come on, quit messing with me. She's like, no, I've taken two. And I said, well, here's what you're going to do. You're going to take a third one. It's going to be the hospital. It's going to be called a blood test. Because <laughs> there's no way. I mean, this, this, you know, whatever. So she goes to the hospital she takes a blood test the same day. She goes to the hospital to take a blood test. They come back and they say that she's pregnant. They hand her the paper and says, you're pregnant. And so she literally, the story goes, I wasn't with her, but both of our kids were. The story goes that when she gets back into the car, now you got to understand, at this point, we probably have a 16-year-old and a 13-year-old, right? Maybe a 14. Abby's almost 14. And so she gets back in the car. She calls the receptionist and says, hey, did you say I was pregnant or did you say I wasn't pregnant? So she's in denial, and that is not a river in Egypt, okay? Terrible church joke, but anyway. We go to our first ultrasound, and Jill finds out that she's seven months pregnant. Uh, yeah, some of you, yeah, you love that, don't you? She's embarrassed right now. We used to watch this TV show like you was pregnant, you didn't know it. You went to the emergency room, you had a baby. Hey, how y'all doing? Good to see y'all. We lived in Humphreys County back then. Show enough. Show enough. <laughs> right. 
But it was amazing. I could only imagine how parents would feel, parents that want to be parents, and they feel this, this burden on the inside of them, this, this barrenness on the inside of them that they're carrying and they can't have children. Well, that's how Hannah was. And Hannah's husband, his name was Elkanah. He had his own problems. He had two wives. Where's my man at? Yeah, he did. Come on. He had two wives. That's a big problem, right? I'm not going to go into that and explain all of the biblical time two wives stuff. That'll be another sermon for another day that I probably won't preach. But their name was Hannah and Penina. And, and here was the biggest problem, okay? Penina had children, but Hannah had none. We see that in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 2. Penina, here's this one wife of his. She's bearing children like crazy. She's spitting them babies out, man. And then Hannah's over here, and Hannah was barren. So if you're taking notes today, write that down. Hannah was barren. And in the culture that day, that was a huge problem. Now, I know you're probably a man in the room today or maybe watching online going, this has nothing to do with me. Not true. Because there's a lot of us, we're barren. We're not bearing fruit in our lives. I want you to look at this not only naturally like a mama, but I also want you to look at this spiritually today as we talk about it. Because this barrenness was a huge thing. This would have been looked on in culture in that day as an embarrassment. It would have been very humiliating, right? But the Bible says that Elkanai loved Hannah. Look at your neighbor and say, he loved her. He loved her. Let's go to it and, and see in Scripture what that actually means. It's 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 5. It says, but to Hannah, his second wife, he would give a double portion for he loved Hannah. Although, listen, this is a key part, the Lord had closed her womb. Now, hold on. Because a lot of times when we experience barrenness, I'm not saying that everybody that experiences barrenness is this way. I'm just saying, go with me for a minute. Because when we experience barrenness in our life, we always blame the devil. And we don't look at it like, okay, is this part of God's plan? Is God trying to work something out of me? Is God trying to get me to a place of trust and faith and obedience and sacrifice, even though I may not get my heart's desire when I want it? Is God trying to do something in me? And what we do is we put the devil on a pedestal and we start giving the devil credit for something that God's trying to do in our life. Well, the devil's tearing me up. No, maybe God's tearing you up. Now, I'm not saying that God tears you up all the time. That's where the spirit of discernment has to come in. But again, go with me as I preach this today. Because a lot of times what we do is we don't even look at scriptures that said the Lord caused the barrenness in her life. The Lord caused that. There was a purpose. There's always purpose in the pain. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, there's purpose in that pain. It looks painful in the moment, but if you just stay faithful, in a few days, it'll all turn around. You see what I'm saying? And, and I think that this is where we're seeing this lady by the name of Hannah, and she's fixing to teach us something. Because there's always progress in the process that Jesus has for our lives. And if we don't watch it, we will stop at the barrenness. And we'll start saying, the devil brought the barrenness in our life, and the devil has caused you to run away from God, and the devil did this. No, you did it. Devil didn't cause you to walk into the bar. You walked into the bar. Come on. The devil didn't thump the needle a few times and pop the arm and shoot something in your... No, the devil didn't do that. You did that. Come on. The devil didn't make you get in the bed with her. You climbed into the bed with her. <laughs> is this okay today? Oh, what a Mother's Day sermon. This is great. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> But she was, she was barren, and God sometimes puts us in positions and allows us the faith, if we'll apply it, to go through the progress of the process to get down here to where he ultimately wants us to be. So she's barren, and because of her barrenness, she becomes burdened. I'm going to give you four B's today. Barren, and now she's burdened. Okay, let's go to 1 Samuel 1, 6, and 7. And this is how she's burdened. Say Penina. Oh, that old witch Penina. We're going to talk about it today. And her rival, Penina, also provoked her severely. 
Listen, you got, you got to go deep with me for a minute. To make her miserable because, listen, the Lord had closed her womb. Now hold on. Let's think about it in a different way. Do you know your rival is provoking you severely to make you miserable because the Lord's trying to do something in your life? Your rival, the devil, you feel this burden and you, you're burdened and you're all weighed down. A burden is a load. That's why the Bible says, come to me, all you who are burdened and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest for my yoke is easy and my burden is light, is what Jesus is saying. So here's what he's saying. He's saying, if you'll come to me, you'll be yoked up with an easy yoke. Because what, what we do sometimes, we'll take the burdens, and if I had a yoke, y'all know what a yoke is, right? When he's talking about a yoke, they would yoke two oxen together to plow a field, right? And the bigger oxen would pull the younger oxen around and be training that younger oxen as he is pulling him and showing him how to plow the field or do whatever they were doing, right? I wonder who you're yoked up with in your burdens, when you're burdened, I wonder who you're tied to and if the devil's pulling you around and showing you his ways and teaching you all of the things that he's doing or is God, are you, are you yoked up with God to where even though you don't understand it, he's teaching you and training you through the whole process? Because you have to understand, you have, a, you have a rival. You have somebody that is not for you. The Bible says that he comes to kill, steal, and destroy that's the devil, but God has come to give life. We know that, right? And not just life, but abundant life. But there's a burden. So what do I do with the burden? Well, you don't allow the devil to use the burden to provoke you se severely and make you miserable. The problem in the church today is a lot of people are too miserable. They're not happy because they get to go through trials and tribulation and suffer persecution. We're not happy for that anymore. The Bible says, consider it pure joy, my brethren. When you face various trials and temptations and tribulation and all the type of things. So you mean to tell me that I should consider it pure joy? Yeah, because he chose you for something. And because he chose you for something, now the enemy is coming and provoking you. And he's provoking you severely. And he's making you miserable. Why? Because the Lord's doing something. The Lord has closed her room. God's turning everything around for your good. You either believe that stuff or you don't. He works all things together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. You either believe that word or you don't believe that word. I choose to believe that word. Amen. The Lord had closed her womb. Let's keep on going. I'm preaching. Verse 7. <laughs> then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, listen to this. Hannah, why do you weep? Why are you weeping? Why? Do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Listen to what he says. He says, am I not better to you than ten sons? All the blessing that I've given you, all the things. And I want to tell you, man, I don't care what you do to try to help somebody through a very difficult trial. No, you're not better than ten sons. I want my own son. I don't need your money. I don't need your horses or your cattle or your sheep. I don't need any of that, Elkanai. I need a son. What is it, Proverbs 12, 25? Anxiety in the heart of a man causes depression. So when you allow the burden to get on the inside of you, because that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants your burden to get to your heart and push you down to where now you're sitting in a room, in a deep, dark room, crying yourself to sleep, wondering why God, why God, why God? But the Bible goes on to say in the same verse, the B part, it says, but a good word. But a good word makes it glad. It makes what glad? It makes the heart glad. Anxiety in the heart causes depression, but a good word in the heart, it causes happiness. It causes you to be glad. And I don't know who I'm speaking to today, but God is wanting to shift some things around in your life. He, he wants to take you from where you're at to where you're going. And he's not going to say, hey, get in the little spiritual car and we're going to 
bust through a few walls and you're going to get there immediately, what he's going to do is he's going to change your mindset and now you're going to see yourself there before you ever get there. And that's some of the things that are happening in Hannah's life because she's barren and she's burdened, but her burden causes her to be something that the church needs today. You know what it is? Broken. Did you, do you remember what I said? The, the progress, there's progress to the process. If this is a four-step process, there's progress. Well, how, barrenness? You're saying from barrenness to burden, that's progress? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because you're not stuck in the barrenness anymore. You're not, you're not stuck there. Now you've got this burden on the inside of you. And now that you've got a burden on the inside of you, now you become broken before God. I heard a preacher say it one time, and he said this. He said, if it's not broke, break it for God. And I go, what? That makes no sense. If it's not broke, break it. In other words, sometimes we live such a fine-tuned little Christian life that we miss the true blessings of God. And now we've gotten so saved that we're too good to go to an altar. We've gotten so saved that our marriage don't need to be fixed because of our pride and our selfishness and all the other things. You've got to break that stuff before God. It's got to break. And that's what we're seeing in this lady's story. Let's go on to verses 10 and 11. It says this in 1 Samuel 1, And she was in bitterness of soul, and she prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Now hold on a minute. Leave that that scripture up just for a minute. She's in bitterness of soul, and she prayed to the Lord and wept. She's got this burden on the inside of her, and now she finds herself broken before God. She's in the midst of the temple. There's a priest there. His name was Eli. Eli is watching her. he's, He's just on the backside of everything, watching all of this play out. And the Bible records that Eli is like, This lady is drunk. There is something wrong with this lady. Have you ever went to the altar and your snot drip was half as long as your arm? Anybody? Come on. Y'all know what? That was kind of nasty. Happy Mother's Day. Because y'all be wiping the snot off all the time. But, But have you ever went to the altar and it got nasty? And you didn't care? And you got up from the altar and you look like you just got beat up by a Mack truck? Because God wrecked you at the altar. This was her. This was Hannah. She's being wrecked right there at the altar. And she's crying out to God. The priest is going, honey, are you you okay? You okay? Need me to call the ambulance? I'll get a horse down here real quick. (laughs) She was weeping. She had this bitterness of soul. But guess what she did? She prayed to the Lord. She prayed to God. She took her burden to God. And she became broken. You know what happens when you take your burden to God? You step out of the way so that God can step in to your situation. That's what she did. That's what it means when we call people down at the altar and people are coming and kneeling and asking people to pray for them. Really what you're doing is you're saying, God, okay, I'm stepping out of the way and I'm going to go pray so that you can step in my situation. I've got to weep. Who cares about all these people that are around? Who cares that if I just brought a a co-worker with me and she already thinks our church is crazy, she's going to think I'm crazy if I'm up here uh, uh, just weeping at the altar. Who cares? Who cares? You've got to take it before God. You, You know what the America church need, the American church? You know what we need? We need a good old dose of brokenness. We need a good, you want to know what's really going to bring revival to America? Brokenness. Us coming before God and saying, God, we can't do this without you. What if we made this? Three songs, an altar, and a preaching time, and get the offering? What if we made it? Break us, God. Break us. It's in our brokenness that we'll finally discover 
God's true will. Verse 11, then she made a vow. She's praying. She's uh, uh, in bitterness of soul. She's praying to the Lord. She's weeping in anguish. She makes a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if, if. I love that word. Love it. See, I think we, when we read Scripture, we just kind of read over stuff. Quit it. Can't read over it. If you will indeed look. You know what that word if meant? If is, if is um, if you do it, great. If you don't, fine. Now, that's a prayer. That's a heartfelt prayer. That gets God's attention. If, you do, if God, you answer this prayer, I understand it may not be in God's will. I don't understand everything that goes on in life. I don't. I don't understand why a few weeks ago we had to bury an uncle because of an accident. He was mowing the churchyard, and his zero-turn mower flips over on top of him. He dies. I don't understand that. She don't understand at this point, God, I'm barren. My husband's saying he's trying to bless me, and he's better than ten sons. No, he's not. If you indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant. Go on to the next one. But will give your maidservant a male child. Then, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head. Now, I don't know if you know the prayer that she just prayed. She didn't pray a prayer like all of us pray at times. God, if you get me out of this situation, I'll serve you for the rest of my life. No, you won't. You're going to leave the church as soon as you get out of the situation. That's what happens. The majority of the people, they get out of their little trouble, they get out of their time, and then they go back out into the world. That's the reality. We don't want to say it. Nobody will say it. I'll say it for us because I think that's the reality. I've done it. You've done it. We've all done it. Hannah wasn't sitting here but just bargaining with God and saying, God, if, if you'll do this, and God, if you'll do that, then I, that, that's, that's not the type of prayer it was. Hannah got to the point in brokenness that she knew only God could open her womb. You want to talk about a hard knock life? This is a life full of trials and tribulation and trouble. This was a lady that we can really learn from today. Only God could open her womb. If we ever get to the point and we understand that only God can bring the miracles that we're searching for. Only God can bring the deliverance that we're looking for for our city. Only God can deliver the addict. Only God can set that marriage free. Only God can do those things. We're, we're focusing it now. Now look, you, you're going to have to run with me for a minute. But because I'm not against this stuff, but we're more apt to raise up leaders and try to figure out how many people we can get in place to help. Can we just pray to God? Can we just do that? Can we just seek the face of God and say, God, only you can open the womb. Only you can save the city. Only you can redeem America. Only you, God. Can we just get back to that? And I will tell you, when you start speaking to those things that are not as though they were, you better watch out. Come on, when you start looking at anything that you're going through and you start saying, you know what, I may be barren today, but I won't always be barren. I don't know who you think you are, devil, but I'm coming after you in the name of Jesus. You may have tried to shut some things up in my life, but they're not going to be shut up anymore. I'm going to do what God has called me to do. I'm going to say what God's called me to say. Come on, church. Y'all get me to screaming on my birthday. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, you better watch out. Why? Because it's a magnet to God. Listen to this, Mark chapter 11. One of my favorite texts when it comes to faith, it says, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, anything you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you'll have them. Ask, believe, receive. That's a three-step process that's laid out in Mark chapter 11, verse 12. Ask, believe, receive. Now, I'm not telling you today to ask for a million dollars and believe for that million dollars, and a million dollars is going to be in First Bank's account with your name on it next week. If God can't trust you with a thousand dollars, what makes you think he's going to give you a million dollars? 
If God can't trust you with your family now, I'm just saying, guys, we want God to come up with some kind of miraculous thing in our life when we're not even taking care of our life right now. My grandfather uh, and grandmother, both of them, they just lived a life of excellence, man. I'm, my grandmother would not allow me, she, she raised me, she would not allow me to leave the house with a t-shirt on that was not ironed. That's why I still I ironed my t-shirt this morning. I iron everything that I have. Some people go, why are you ironing your pants? I ironed my pants this morning. Why? Because that has been taught and just pushed on the inside of me. Why? Because you, you've got to dress for success. My grandfather would instill things on the inside of me and start telling me, son, if, if you want something, take care of what you got to get what you want. I got neighbors that make fun of me. You want to know why? Because every time I mow my yard, I wash my lawnmower. Make fun. Go ahead, make fun. When I had a 1988 Beretta, what did I do? That thing on the outside, the rust and everything, it stayed clean. Why? Because I knew if I took care of this, maybe I would be able to get this one day. Are you even taking care of your life right now? You want healing in your body, but you can't quit smoking. Oh, I just went there. Oh my gosh, she just gave me a look. I can't believe it. Quit smoking right now. I'm just kidding. You don't smoke. Do you get what I'm saying though? You want healing in your body, but you're doing things that causes sickness and disease to come into your body. When you start believing and living in what you want, I think those things, according to Mark chapter 11, it begins to show up in your life. Come on, somebody. I just got all y'all wound up over a cigarette. <laughs> Come on. Son. You got to think about that. Because, again, there's, this, there's a method. There's progress in the process, right? It started with barrenness. It goes to the burden. She gets broken. You know what happens after her brokenness? She received her blessing. That's what happened. She received her blessing. Now, we all, we, we all want the blessing before the brokenness. We don't want to be broken because God's grace is sufficient for me. And I don't have to be broken because God is good. And if God was good, he wouldn't make me broken. That's the fake gospel that is being preached today. And it's causing everybody to trip out. Like, well, is God really God? Because if God was God, why did that happen? I don't know, ask Hannah. Because if God was really God, why did God cause her womb to be barren? Because there's always progress in the process. Because once she got broken, you know what she received? A blessing. The blessing. 1 Samuel 1, 17 and 18. You guys can go ahead and come on out, get on the piano. Nope. Then Eli... The priest answered and said, he's, he's hearing all of this stuff that she's praying, right? Go in peace and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. Just go in peace. My word to you today is, hey, you know what? When you pray and you ask God and you have a genuine heart, you know what you need to do after that prayer? You need to go in peace. Go in peace and I pray that the God of Israel... The, the Lord and Savior of our life, Jesus Christ, grants you your petition, which you've asked of Him today. And then He goes on, verse 18, and she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman, listen to this, went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. I pray that you get a revelation of God in such a way that when you get up from a prayer moment that your face is no longer sad. That, that you come up from a prayer moment and there's something that's shifted on the inside of you and now you really believe what you've been praying. 
Because it's one thing to pray it. God, heal, heal my body. Or God, God, heal my son. Take my son out of this addiction. Do all of that. There's going to be a day that I pray that in your brokenness, you're going to get up and you're finally going to go, Whew, God's going to heal my son. God's going to deliver me from this or deliver me from that. How do you do that? By faith. Her faith made her whole. Her faith. And the Bible says, you say, well, I don't have faith like that. The Bible does say that each of us have been given a measure of faith. We all have a measure of faith. And the Bible also says that if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, that you can say to this mountain, be thou cast into the sea, and that mountain will be cast into the sea. Now, that's... that's unfathomable to us. And if we can't wrap our heads around that and go, God, that's how vast you are. If you can do that to a mountain, you can do that in my life. Amen. That's what was happening in Hannah's life right now. Her faith made her hope. I could go through the Bible and tell you a bunch of people that the, the Lord Jesus looked at them and said, your faith has made you whole. You know what your faith does? Your faith brings conception. And her faith, when she got in this moment of faith and brokenness, she conceived. And when she conceived, she weaned that child and she gave that child back to the Lord. Can I break this down for you a little bit, a little bit more? Um, we did child dedications today. We actually, sometimes it's mentioned about Hannah and dedicating her child to the Lord. You know, we, we know that Jesus, his parents took him on the eighth day, I think it was, after he was born, took him back to the temple and did what? Dedicated him to the Lord. That's why we do child dedications. But this level of dedication of the child was totally different. She weaned that child. Most scholars say that that child was between three and five years old. Three and five. Can you believe that? She weans this child. He's about three to five years old. She brings him back to the temple, dedicates him to the Lord and says, Eli, thank you. Thank you, God. I'm a woman of my word. You said you'd give me a son. I told you if you'd give me a son, I'd give him back to you. She walked out. Some of you are like, hold on a minute. I can make that deal with God right now. <laughs> we, can, we can do that today, preacher. Y'all keeping them here? Where are you going? It was a whole different level of dedication. I want you to see the importance of the parent. 1 Samuel 1, 17, or, or actually 27 and 28. She comes back, she brings the child back to the temple, and she says, for this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. And the Bible goes on to say, and he worshiped the Lord there. Whoa, hold on a minute. A lot. Eli? Is that who he's talking about? Like Eli worshiped the Lord, you know? Like, oh, praise God. Now I got a three year old to take care of. Hallelujah. No, Samuel. Samuel worshiped the Lord there. How did Samuel even know how to worship the Lord? Because of Hannah. That's why I'm telling you, parents, we, we have a mandate on our lives. Rachel, our kids director, she actually mentioned this in her little talk, which I thought was amazing today before the child dedication. And she mentioned that, church, we have a mandate to help. We have a mandate as Christians to raise our children. And I'm just, I've been throwing stuff out. Happy Mother's Day, right? I'm going to throw something else out today. I think we need to get just as serious about raising our kids in church as we are about raising them at the ball fields. That's not condemning ball fields because I like ball fields. I love it. Every Saturday, we hanging out. We're doing it. I love that. I'm not condemning that. But I want to tell you, when that takes precedence over God, you're teaching your kids something. What you're doing at that point, you're teaching your kid that this is more important than that. Whether they're five years old in T-ball or they're 13, 14 year old in, in junior league, whatever it may be, you're teaching your kid. What are we doing? How are we going to approach the future? How are we going to allow this progress to take place in our life, in this process that God has so that we can ultimately live down here 
which is the ultimate blessing of God. You gotta walk through the steps if you want down here. Some of you, you're on step one. You're barren. What do I do? What do I do? Let's just talk about it. You have to come to the knowledge of God. If you don't give everything over to God, you'll never get everything that he has for you. So right now, even in this moment, you gotta start thinking, have I given everything over to God because I'm gonna include myself in this. I think we have not sold ourselves out to God. Most of us, we've just, we've given like 10% of ourselves to God. 30% of ourselves to God. God doesn't want 10 to 30% of you. He wants 100% of you. And when he gets 100% of you, then is when you're going to receive that burden of what God has called you to do or what God is wanting you to do. And during that burden, you go, oh my gosh, this is too heavy. What do I do? You hand it back to God in brokenness saying, I can't do this. I can't do this. And then that's when the blessing comes. I got to stop. I got to stop. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you so much for who you are, for what you've done. Pray that you'll just speak to the hearts of the people today as we just take a moment. We give you honor and glory for who you are, what you've called us to do. God, I just sense not as a generic general statement, I really sense that there's some barren people in this place. When I talked about barrenness, they just said, man, that's me, that's me. Maybe it's a natural barrenness, but maybe it's a spiritual barrenness. They just don't understand. Why am I not receiving what everybody else receives? Why am I not feeling what everybody else feels? Or, 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 or you know, the list could just go on and on, God. But if there's anybody in here today and you're in that barren place, and you're ready to take the next step with God. God, whatever this burden looks like, whatever that brokenness looks like in my life, God, I'm ready to just go. I'm ready to go all in. I'm tired of putting everything else in front of you. I'm ready to go all in for the sake of God. If that's you, would you slip up your hand real quick? Go ahead, slip up your hand, slip up your hand. Slip up your hand. God's changing people. I feel it in this place. Say this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, in this moment, I give everything I have to you. And I ask you to take this barrenness, to take my hurt, my pain, my mistakes, my sins, everything I've done wrong. God, I confess that stuff to you. And I ask that you become the Lord of my life and that you use me in this process that you have for me that you'll reveal to me the things that I may not understand because you're good, you're faithful, you're just. Thank you for being my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, give God a big hand clap today.